Good evening, one and all. I welcome you all to Ganesh IS Academy. In today's session, we'll be seeing science and technology based current affairs from the date March 10 to March 20, 2024. Let us get into the news articles one by one. The first news that we are going to discuss for today is Mission Divya Astra. So, what is this Divya Astra? To which missile system is it related to? All these details we must have to understand. Let us see why is it in the news. So, India recently conducted a test of Agni 5 ballistic missile with MIRV technology. That is the reason why is it in the news. So, what is this MIRV technology? MIRV here is multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle. Okay, we will get into the details of the technology in, up, in the upcoming slides. Okay. So, this test was carried out by DRDO that is Defense Research and Development Organization as a part of Mission Divya Astra. So, this test is coming under Mission Divya Astra that is what we need to know and which is the missile system that is related to this? It is Agni 5 ballistic missile. So, here we need to understand what is Agni type of missiles. It is coming under which program? It was under which program and what is Agni 5? And what is this new variant of Agni 5 that is MIRV technology. All these details we must have to understand and we will also be getting into the details of what is ballistic missiles and how are ballistic missiles classified. All these details will be discussed in this section. So yes, what are Agni missiles? Agni missiles are long range ballistic missiles. Ballistic missiles are those which take a ballistic trajectory. So, this is a ballistic trajectory. Okay, such a trajectory is called as ballistic trajectory. Trajectory. So, this is the launch and this is the place where the target is located. So, I have to move in this direction. This is the ballistic trajectory that we are talking about. And it is designed for surface to surface attacks and it is capable of carrying nuclear payloads. So, this Agni 5 is capable of carrying nuclear payload and then it is surface to surface attacking missile. Okay. So, a question about Agni was also asked in UPSC 2023 prelims examination. So, these topics are important. Okay. That question was actually from the basics of what Agni is. Okay. So, Agni here is long range ballistic missile, surface to surface missile. Next is the first missile in the series of Agni was Agni 1, which was developed under integrated guided missile development program, which was tested in the year 1989. That is, Agni 1 was tested in the year 1989 and it comes under integrated guided missile development program, which is actually a brainchild of Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. Okay. Moreover, it has become a special program after its success. So, after its success, this Agni missile program became an independent program from this integrated guided missile development program due to its strategic significance. It became strategically significant because it is ballistic and it is having long range. Okay, And it has become intercontinental ballistic from continent to continent that is whose range is more than 5500 kilometers. We will be seeing all those details in, uh, in the upcoming slides. So, it was designated as a special program in India's defense budget and it received sufficient funds for further development. Okay, So, that is the reason why it has become a special program here, Agni missiles. Okay. Next, we need to understand what is Agni 5. Okay? Before understanding what is Agni 5, here we saw integrated guided missile development program. So, what are all the other missiles that are there under this program that we need to know? Okay? So, the other programs under this, I mean the other missiles under this program are short range surface to surface ballistic missile that is Prithvi. Okay? short range surface to surface ballistic missile Prithvi and intermediate range and long range actually initially it was developed as an intermediate range surface to surface ballistic missile but later it has become intermediate to intercontinental surface to surface ballistic missile that is Agni okay Agni and then short range low level surface to air missile that is Trishul so this is surface to air surface to air this is surface to surface 
this is surface to surface okay again medium range surface to surface is akash again surface to surface medium range and then comes the third generation anti tank missile that is nag okay so all these are part of integrated guided missile development program okay which is very important to be noted so how will you remember this this patan okay first two are surface to surface missiles and then the next two are surface to air and then comes anti tank missile so this is how it is easy for you to remember it okay so these are all the missiles under igmdp and agni is one of them okay so now let us understand the details of what are all the different missile variants of agni agni missiles different variants here we are seeing that it is given as MRBM, MRBM, what is MRBM? Medium range ballistic missile, intermediate range ballistic missile, intercontinental ballistic missile. So, before understanding the variants of the Agni, we need to understand how the ballistic missiles are classified. Okay. So, let us first understand how ballistic missiles are classified and then come to this portion. Types of ballistic missiles based on the range. So, ballistic missiles are generally classified based on its range. Okay. So, what is short range? Short range means the range is between 3000 kilometer to 1000, sorry, 300 kilometer to 1000 kilometer. That is short range. And then comes medium range, whose range is between 1000 kilometer and 3500 kilometer. And then intermediate range, here the range is from 3500 to 5500, and anything more than 5500 becomes intercontinental ballistic missile okay so agni here is intermediate to intercontinental okay so this is how you need to classify the missiles and what is a ballistic missile this is the ballistic trajectory that we were talking about so it takes a ballistic trajectory and it has three different phases one is boost phase mid course phase and then comes the re-entry phase okay in boost phase why is it called boost phase that is because until boost phase only the propellants will be working or the propulsion will be given and after that the engine will be put to off okay next it will come under i mean with that thrust sorry thrust it will reach this maximum height and after that it will come under the pressure of, i mean in the influence of the gravity the re-entry okay so here only up till this point the propulsion is given and rest is going on its own okay from here to here it is because of the thrust given here and from here to here it is because of gravity's influence such a trajectory taken by the missiles are called as ballistic trajectory now let us understand the different variants of agni So, we have Agni 1. Agni 1 is medium range ballistic missile. So, the range is here and it is operational. And then Agni P is Agni prime here. Okay. It is expected to replace Agni 1, 2 and Prithvi. Okay. That we already saw. That is short range surface to surface ballistic missile. So, this Agni prime will be replacing Agni 1, Agni 2 and Prithvi that we already saw in integrated guided missile development program. And then comes Agni 2, again medium range. And then Agni 3 and Agni 4, both are intermediate range. And they are operational too. And this Agni Prime is not yet operational. It is under development. Okay. And then comes Agni 5, which we are talking about now. Which it is an intercontinental ballistic missile whose range is from 7,000 to 8,000 kilometers. And it is operational now. And we have another future variant that is Agni 6 which will again be intercontinental ballistic missile and see the range. It has a range of 11,000 to 12,000 kilometer and it is under development now. Okay. So, now we need to discuss about the details of Agni 5 because the new variant is Agni 5. Okay. So, Agni 5 is India's intercontinental ballistic missile we saw and its range is beyond 11,000, sorry, 5,000 
kilometers. So actually its range is 7000 to 8000 kilometers and it can reach most parts of China. Okay, a nearby country and it is a three stage missile which is powered by solid fuel. Such questions are also asked whether the missile or the rocket is solid fuel or liquid fuel, what are all the different stages that are there, how many stages are there, all these facts are also important. So using composite motor casing, the second and the third stages makes it lighter improving both its range and the payload capability. Just because it is using a composite motor casing, it is having improved range and improved payload capacity. Moreover, the latest variant, we need to talk about the latest variant that is MIRV. So the missile's latest variant features MIRV which was developed over five decades ago. So this is not a new technology. It was developed over five decades ago and it is possessed by only a few countries and India has become one of the countries now. That is the reason why we are discussing it now. So now let us understand the details of MIRV. What is it? It stands for Multiple Independently Targetable Re-Entry Vehicle that is MIRV. So multiple, many targets are there independently targetable all those targets can be independently targeted and it is a re-entry vehicle re-entry vehicle means ballistic vehicles are actually called as re-entry vehicles because we saw there are three different phases of ballistic missiles okay one is boost phase intermediate phase and then the re-entry phase okay so it is a missile technology that enables one missile to carry multiple nuclear warheads and each capable of hitting different targets. So if you see this, a normal missile will be having only one target, I mean one payload here, warhead, okay? But here you have multiple warheads. So re-entry vehicle carrying nuclear warheads and each re-entry vehicle can be independently targeted and launched from one missile, but hitting different targets. So each of the payload will be hitting different targets here. So that is MIRV technology and the other countries who are having this technology, who are equipped with this technology are United States, Russia, China, France and United Kingdom. Okay, so they are the ones who are possessing this technology and these missiles can be launched from either land based platforms or submarines at sea. So it can be launched from terrestrial platform or it can also be launched from submarines at sea. So these are all the details that we need to know about the mission Divya Astra. So here we discussed about what is Agni, what is the program that is Integrated Guided Missile Development Program and what are all the missiles that are coming under that program and we also discussed about the details of the different types of ballistic missiles, the categories of ballistic missiles and Agni-5 missiles we discussed and the new variant of Agni-5 that is MIRV. All these were discussed. The topic that we are going to discuss now is parthenogenesis. What is parthenogenesis? Why is it in news? That is because researchers have achieved a significant break breakthrough by engineering a sexually reproducing fruit fly species to reproduce asexually. So this fruit fly species sexually reproduces but then now it has been tweaked, it has been engineered to reproduce asexually and this kind of asexual reproduction is called as parthenogenesis. So now let us understand what parthenogenesis is. So it refers to the process of reproduction without fertilization by males. So there won't be any fertilization from males, directly females will be reproducing. So resulting in offsprings derived from the unfertilized eggs of the female. Okay, so this is what we need to know, that is parthenogenesis. So there are different types of parthenogenesis, let us understand that and what are all the advantage or significance of parthenogenesis that we will discuss. So there are two different types of parthenogenesis, one is obligate and the other is facultative okay so what is obligate that is parthenogenesis species may be obligate which means that is incapable of sexual reproduction there may be certain organisms which are incapable of sexual reproduction 
so they go by asexual reproduction okay so that is obligate parthenogenesis but there is another category called as facultative parthenogenesis what does it means it is capable of switching between parthenogenesis and sexual reproduction depending upon the environmental condition so based on the environmental condition these organisms will be switching between sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction that is facultative parthenogenesis and the examples for facultative parthenogenesis are crayfish snakes homodo dragons and sharks and these are exhibiting facultative parthenogenesis so if you see here in sexual reproduction this is how it happens male and female is there and then the egg is fertilized by the male okay and then you'll have offsprings here the sex ratio is one is to one either it can be male or female so sex ratio is one is to one here and the hatching success of unfertilized egg is less than one percentage here this is also something to be noted okay so the hatching success of the unfertilized eggs are less than one percentage here in terms of sexual reproduction but when we go for parthenogenesis and the subtype that is obligate parthenogenesis then the sex ratio is female only okay and here the hatching success of unfertilized egg is more than 75 percentage so there are there are more fertilized eggs that is what we need to know next is facultative parthenogenesis what is it we saw that it will be switching between asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction so this is sexual reproduction this insect with this insect sexually reproducing to produce these two offsprings but it will also or it is capable of doing asexual reproduction also so if you see the sex ratio here it is biased it is biased towards female bundle because it is also having asexual reproduction and even here the hatching success of unfertilized eggs is between 10 percentage and 75 percentage here it is less than percentage here it is more than 75 percentage and here it is between 10 percentage and 75 percentage so this is what we need to understand from this that is different types of parthenogenesis obligate and facultative now let us understand the significance of parthenogenesis why parthenogenesis is significant why asexual reproduction is significant so it is a type of adaptative strategy so we can consider this to be a type of adaptative strategy to reproduce when the environmental conditions are not proper and sexual reproduction is not possible okay when sexual reproduction is not possible then we may i mean those organisms will be going for parthenogenesis and it allows the species to continue thriving and multiplying in some environments where there is less male population so if male population is going to be less then sexual reproduction is not conducive there okay in such situations for the population to thrive those organisms will be undergoing this parthenogenesis next is it enables sex determination in some organisms like wasps and bees okay sex determination is also enabled here and it is the simplest and most stable and easy process of reproduction which is to be kept in mind because we saw see here they are saying it is simplest and most stable because the unfer the hatching of unfertilized eggs is more in parthenogenesis okay next is it supports the chromosomal theory of inheritance which proves that the chromosomes are the vehicle of genetic hereditary so just with homo uh, i mean uh, chromosomes i can go for genetic variation so this is what they are saying and advantageous mutant characters may develop through this method of reproduction so advantageous mutant mutant ca characters might develop with the help of parthenogenesis okay so these are all the significance of parthenogenesis i hope it is clear now the topic that we are going to discuss now is lyme disease what is this Lyme disease? Let us get into the details. Recently, a case of Lyme disease has been reported from Ernakulam district of Kerala. And what is Lyme disease? It is a vector bone disease. Okay. So, there is a vector, an insect here. Okay. The insect here is tick. Okay. So, it is vector bone infectious disease which is caused by bacterium Borrelia burgdorferi. So, the bacteria's name here is Borrelia 
Bergdorf ferry. So here, what is the takeaway here? That it is caused by a pathogen and the pathogen here is bacteria. Okay. So it is vector borne disease. One factor. Another is the pathogen here is the bacteria. Next is how is the transmission happening here? How Lyme disease is transmitted from one person to another. So the primary transmission mode to humans is through the bite of the infected black legged ticks. Ticks, okay. So when those infected black leg ticks bite humans, then we may get infected, okay. But it is to be noted that it cannot spread between humans. So one human spreading it to another is not a possibility, and it will not spread from pets to humans or through air, food, or water. So it is not contagious, okay. So it will not spread through air food or water and it will not be transmitted from pets to humans also and human to human transmission is also not there. The only way of transmission is from the infected insect biting humans. Okay, And then even other insects like lice, mosquitoes, fleas and flies do not transmit this. Only those ticks are capable of transmitting this Lyme disease. What else do we have to know? We need to know the symptoms of the Lyme disease. So what are all the symptoms of Lyme disease? Early symptoms appear between 3 to 30 days after an infected tick bite. So early symptoms after 3 to 30 days. Next is it manifests with fever, headache, fatigue and a characteristic blue eye rash called as erythema migraine. So such blue eyed rash will develop. This is a characteristic feature of Lyme disease and this erythema migraine serves as the hallmark sign of the early diagnosis of this disease. One important factor to be noted and if the person is left untreated then it can lead to severe complications like affecting joints, heart and the nervous system of the, of the person. Okay, So headache, hearing loss or paralysis of face, muscle soreness, erythema migraines and then heart complications, nausea and vomiting. These are all the symptoms of the Lyme disease, which is a vector here. This is the deer tick that we are talking about. Okay. And the pathogen here is the bacteria Borrelia. Okay. So pathogen is bacteria caused by vector that is deer tick. So how does its prevalence? Here can we find this disease? Okay. It's geographical prevalence. So, it is prevalent in hooded and grassy areas of the world, especially during the warmer months. So, during the warmer months, it is spreading and the most commonly reported areas are North America, Europe and some parts of Asia. And what is the treatment option that we have for this Lyme disease? So, the standard treatment here involves antibiotics like doxycycline or amoxicillin especially in the early stages and intravenous antibiotic may be required in the later stages. So this is what we need to know about Lyme disease which is a vector borne disease which is spreading through bacteria as a pathogen and here human to human trans transmission is not possible. Only transmission mode here is the infected insect biting human. Okay, So this is what we need to know from this particular topic. The topic that we are going to discuss now is hemoglobin A1c test. It is actually a test which is taken. Okay, HB here is hemoglobin A1c. What is this A1c test and how is it different from the traditional test and what are all the advantages that it has? All these details we need to know. So, hemoglobin A1c, it is a test which is widely used for prevention and early detection of non-communicable diseases including diabetes, okay, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And then this HbA1c test is also known as glycated hemoglobin or glycosylated hemoglobin test. It is called as glycated hemoglobin test or glycosylated hemoglobin test. So, why do we have to assess or test hemoglobin to detect diabetes? That background we need to know. Okay, So the link between hemoglobin and diabetes that is given here. Our food contains sugar which enters the bloodstream. 
okay human blood stream will be having sugar okay and this sugar sticks to a protein called as hemoglobin so hemoglobin here is a kind of protein which is there in our blood and then the sugar will get stuck to the hemoglobin in our red blood cells and what is the role of this hemoglobin it carries oxygen from our lungs to the rest of our body okay so hemoglobin's work is to carry oxygen from our lungs to the rest of the body and then in that process the sugar will stick to this protein that is hemoglobin now they are going to assess this hemoglobin okay and then find how much of sugar is there diabetes is there okay type 1 and type 2 now let us understand how does it work and in which mode is it presented okay so h1 sorry HbA1c test measures the percentage of the red blood cells with sugar coated hemoglobin. So, there will be a lot of blood cells and only certain amount is coated with sugar. That percentage is assessed here. Okay. So, this HbA1c level can be reported either as percentage or in millimole per mole. Okay. It can either be represented as percentage or it can be represented in millimole per mole. Moreover, it indicates the average blood sugar level over the past few months. This is very important. So, it is not an instant one, but then it gives you the average blood sugar level over the past few months. Moreover, higher level of this HbA1c, it suggests poor blood sugar control while lower level indicate better control. So, if you see here, if the percentage is below 5.7, then it is normal they do not have diabetes and if the percentage is between 5.7 to 6.4 then they are pre-diabetic they may in future get diabetes and then if the percentage is 6.5 or higher then they are diabetic so this is the a1c test that is hba1c test result this is how it is classified okay normal pre-diabetic and diabetic and then what is I mean, what are all the advantages of this new test with the traditional test that we have? So, fasting and post-meal blood sugar test measures sugar level at specific times. Generally, when we go for sugar level test, they will ask you to take two tests. One is during fasting and then another after the meal, okay, after the first meal of the day. So, this is how it is tested. So, two times it is tested and then they will get two values one for fasting value another is the post meal value and then they'll assess it but now here this hba1c test reflects an average glucose level over a period of time that is two or three months so here the average is known here but here it is instant values okay instantly how much blood sugar levels are there but here it is average value for two to three months so this would be a better Test. Next is, unlike the traditional test, this HbA1c isn't influenced by the recent meals, making it more dependable and usable regardless of the meal timing. Very important to be noted. So, here anytime the test can be taken and then it will give you the average for 2 to 3 months. But here it will be, this test that is fasting and post meal test will be heavily influenced by the meal that we have taken immediately before it. Okay. If we are taking a very sugary meal then the sugar will be boosted immediately and it might not be the average or the correct value so that is why there is an advantage for hba1c test and now we need to understand we are talking about this hba1c test in india okay but what is the condition of diabetes in india and pre diabetes in india that we need to know Diabetes and pre-diabetes statistics in India. So, first, diabetes prevalence in India. According to a nationwide study in 2023, India has approximately 101.3 million individuals who are diagnosed with diabetes. Okay? 10 crore people are diagnosed with diabetes. And pre-diabetic population, that is, there are around 136 million individuals who are classified as pre-diabetic in the country, which means they are likely to become diabetic in near future. 
and what is the global impact here on global level what is the contribution of india that india accounts for 17 percentage of the total global diabetes patient population which is very huge okay and then what are all the other associated health conditions here so first one is hypertension rates so over 35 percentage of the indians suffer from high blood pressure and it is directly linked to their diabetes level okay next is abdominal obesity so nearly 40 percentage of the population has abdominal obesity and this is also linked to diabetes okay so this is what we need to know here okay hba1c test its advantage and how is it working and what is the status of diabetes in india The topic that we are going to discuss now is Indian Network for Fishery and Animal Antimicrobial Resistance Report. Okay, this is an organization. Okay. So, this Indian Network for Fishery and Animal Antimicrobial Resistance Report, and this is an organization, they have recently released a report. Now, we need to understand the details of the report and what this organization is about and we will be discussing about what antimicrobial resistance is very briefly, okay. So, yes, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and the Indian Council of Agricultural Research released surveillance data of this Indian Network for Fishery and Animal antimicrobial resistance for the year 2019 to 2022 and this report is the first national report on AMR surveillance. AMR here is antimicrobial resistance, okay. AMR surveillance in India's fisheries and livestock sector. Moreover, what is antimicrobial resistance? We are saying that the survey is about antimicrobial resistance, but what is antimicrobial resistance? The basic understanding is that there is a resistance of certain microorganisms like bacteria, vis, uh, viruses, parasites and fungi to antimicrobial agent, okay. They are pathogens, okay. We have to kill them. For killing them, we will be administering certain antimicrobial agents, okay. Initially, they will die, but after certain time, they will gain resistance to those drugs that we are sending to kill them and they will not die okay this is called as antimicrobial resistance and this has become a huge problem now in medical field okay people are working and researchers are going to address this problem okay so antimicrobial resistance is resistance of certain microorganisms to an antimicrobial agents like antibiotics antibiotics fungi sorry fungicides antiviral agents and parasiticides to which they were first sensitive. Initially, they were sensitive, but now they are not sensitive, which means they have gained resistance against these antimicrobial agents. That is what we need to know. So, now in this report, they have assessed in which organisms, especially in fisheries and poultry, they would have assessed this. Let us see the key findings. So, how were the data collected? So, this INFAR collected data from 2019 to 2022 covering three aquaculture systems because fisheries is involved here. So, they have taken three aquaculture systems. One is freshwater, brackish water and marine and even major food producing animals were assessed here for their antimicrobial resistance. So, the resistance pattern in livestock sector they have given here. So, two microbes that is E. coli and Staphylococcus isolates from various livestock were tested for antimicrobial resistance profiles. So, these two are bacteria here, okay, E. coli and Staphylococcus. So, increased resistance especially in E. coli and Staphylococcus was noted in the livestock sector. So, there was an increased resistance which is a problem here. Next is isolates from poultry showed higher resistance rate to various antibiotics compared to those from other food animals. There are other food animals right like um, goats are there I mean 
um, mutton kind of things and then there are other food animals like pig <coughs> cow sheep and other things when compared to all these poultry showed higher resistance rate to various antibiotics so statements like these are important these may be asked in your prelims examination as one of the statements next is about this infar what is infar indian network for fishery and animal antimicrobial resistance what is it actually it is a laboratory network which was established by icar okay and then it receives technical assistance from food and agriculture organization of united nations and then united states agency for international development okay so and it is dedicated to conducting amr surveillance in fisheries and livestock sector very important to be noted from the name itself we can get that it is working for assessing amr surveillance okay for doing amr surveillance okay what is amr antimicrobial resistance and in which two sectors fisheries and livestock sector okay so this may be asked as a question so with this we are coming to end of today's session i hope you found the session to be very useful and informative let us see in the next session thank you all